Hello and welcome to my microbiology video. In this video I'll be talking about Ebola. So this is a follow-on from my previous emerging diseases video, okay? And also any of the information that I'm going to be discussing in this presentation, most of it I found on the on the World Health Organization's website. So if you just go into that link there from the WHO, that will take you to most of the information if anything I've said is unclear or if you have any outstanding queries. So learning objectives is to use Ebola as an example of an emerging disease to di the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention options for Ebola, to understand the relevance of controlling zoonotic reservoirs and their role in spreading diseases, and to understand the relevance of infection control practices. So first of all, what is Ebola? So Ebola is a filovirus, so it's a filamentous virus, so it's not just like a spherical virus, say like flu, it's a filament type virus. And it has a ridiculously high fatality rate, so anything ranging from 25% up to 90%, okay, in some cases. So it is a very, very deadly infection, hence why it's being given a category A rating, so it's first priority. So it's often considered to be a hemorrhagic hemorrhagic fever virus, okay, but, and it is very severe, but in most cases it does not cause hemorrhagic fever. Yes, it still causes fevers, but only in a minimal case it does it cause hemorrhages. And also, when we're going to be discussing about the 2014 outbreak of, well, 2013-2014 outbreak of Ebola, this is going to be based on the Zaya Ebola virus, okay, so it's a similar strain to the Zaya Ebola virus from 1976, which I'll discuss in a bit. Okay, so what are some of the general signs and symptoms for Ebola? So as I said, the hemorrhagic manifestations occur only in a minority of patients. So what I mean by hemorrhagic manifestations is spontaneous bleeding okay so as you can see in the picture in the top right we've got bleeding of the eyes okay so literally the blood vessels are bursting but not only can you get bleeding from the eyes you can get bleeding gums bleeding tongue blood from your ears nosebleeds and even in some cases you will literally be bleeding through your skin so you could just be walking all of a sudden you just have blood just appearing out from the skin that's how much hemorrhagic viruses can affect okay but as i said in the general consensus Hemorrhagic manifestations occur only in a minority. The general symptoms include fever, headache, malaise, myalgia, vomiting, and one of the key symptoms is black diarrhea. Okay, so this is showing you the presence of blood in the feces. And often you'll see coagulation disorders and multiple organ failure. So there are, from what's been understood from literature, there's roughly five different strains of Ebola virus. Okay, so the first two happened pretty much simultaneously, okay, that was the Zaya Ebola virus from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and also the Sudan Ebola virus, both of which happened in 1976. And the reason that it was named Ebola is because the, one of the first reported villages were near the Ebola River, hence we've now called it the Ebola virus. And also in 1990 we had, had a case of Ebola in Reston, so this was f from doing a, necros a necroscopy on a chimpanzee, and from the needle prick caused the incident. There was also the Thai forest virus in 1994 and the Boon de Bujo virus in 2008. But also between this time period there were multiple other outbreaks that reoccurred in Central and East Africa. So for example in the Republic of Congo in 2003, Sudan in 2004, Democratic Republic of Congo 2007 to 2009, and Uganda from 2007 to 2008, even 2012. Okay, so now we're going to start discussing about the zoonotic role of Ebola, okay? So it's not a naturally occurring human pathogen, okay? Human pathogenesis is an, ac is an accidental process, okay? It acts as a natural reservoir within fruit bats, okay? So how, how can it get transmitted around us, okay? Well, you have to quite closely have a look at the sort of life cycle, okay? So you've got the endozootic cycle, so that's how it's transmitted from bats to bats. Okay, so imagine you've got a fruit bat eating a mango, okay, so there are plenty of mango trees throughout Western Africa, for example. So these fruit bats will be eating the mangoes, and while eating the mangoes, they'll have their saliva on the mangoes, they'll be urinating and feces and everything like that. Okay, other bats, obviously in close proximity, will take up the saliva if they're eating from the same mango, or if they're in close proximity, accidental ingestion from of, like feces and urine. So again, so that can cause other bats to get infected, and it's an endless cycle. However, it does not show pathogenicity in bats. Okay, it only shows pathogenicity in primates or other animals. Okay, so anything other than bats will show clinical signs and symptoms. 
However, how can it escape this endozootic cycle, okay? So this one enters the epizootic cycle, so this is outside of its normal natural reservoir. So imagine we've got one of these infected bats and for, for any reason, old age or whatever, they die. Okay, so imagine you've got this dead bat on the floor. Imagine if, say, a child, a chimpanzee or any sort of rodent comes up to this dead bat. If it starts touching it, playing with it, eating it, whatever, those infected, those Ebola viruses within the fluids of the bat will make their way into their new host. So now you've got the Ebola virus within their new host, and this is when it can start showing pathogenicity, thus causing the fever and other signs and symptoms. And within this transmission cycle, so for example, in people, people who are touching the infected patient, cleaning them or anything like that, can also then get infected and then start another vicious cycle from human to human transmission. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about the West Africa Ebola outbreak in 2014. And just as I said, this is a similar strain to the Zaya virus. Okay. So it was reported more than 28,000 reported cases and more than 11,000 deaths from Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia. So the first reported case was on the 2nd of December 2013. Okay, but it was only until March where we actually started getting proper data for this. So in March 2014, we can see that it's quite concentrated the border of Sierra Leone, and Liberia, and Guinea right here. However, yeah, I've got some spread because some of the some of the locals would migrate to other places for travel reasons, for gathering resources, and so on and so forth. Okay, so as you can see, from March 2004 to June 2014, there was a steady build-up. Okay, so it was quite a slow build-up in transmission. But then, as more and more people get infected, you then get exponential increase in transmission. Okay, as you can see from August to November. So you can see a, a lot more dark red regions. And it, and it just keeps progressing hours and hours, becoming more and more people getting infected. And again, as we approach December to early 2015, quite a lot, or well, pretty much all of Sierra Leone is infected, as you can see, even the dark red, and quite a lot of Guinea and Liberia as well. So it was a massive outbreak, considering it spread by touch-to-touch -touch contact transmission. So as I said, the Ebola outbreak was initiated on the 2nd of December. Okay, so on the 2nd of December 2013, a child was reported to found fever, black stools, and vomiting. And as you can see, they had the onset on the 2nd of December, they died on the 6th of December, so it's a very, very quick onset to death. And then, because the family did, probably don't have any medical background or anything like that, they thought, okay, well, let's clean them, feed them, and everything. So they were in constant contact with this infected toddler, and as a result, they then get infected and pass it on. But it wasn't only just the family, okay, even a nurse who was handling, so even the nurse has no concept or how the transmission is going on, okay? And this is often the case because these happen in rural areas. They believe that this could be a result of witchcraft, um, corruption from white people in politics. They don't have this ground understanding of transmission of microbes and viruses. And as a result of this, they would refuse formal health care from outside individuals. So what can affect, like, factors affecting the Ebola outbreak. So if you live in a dense population, okay, so you're in closer proximity with people, you're going to be more likely to become in contact with them. So therefore you're going to be more likely to pass on body fluids, more likely to pass on the infection. Rapid and extensive movement of infected individuals. So as I said, individuals could be holding hands, okay, it's quite a belief for people in these areas for holding hands with their friends and walking to distant places for resources or trade or whatever, okay, so they're traveling to all these different places, getting into contact with other people and passing on this infection to other villages. And also the avoidance or lack of medical facilities, okay, so as I said, some people would refuse going to medical treatment facilities because they believe, or they've got such strong family bonds that they believe the family themselves is all they need for the treatment. In reality, you need professional medical health for this because it is a deadly, deadly infection. And again, as I said, for about Ebola transmission, so one of the main reservoirs is the Pteropopidae family of fruit bats. Okay, so getting into contact with these, you'll be more likely to get Ebola. And this happens by contact with bodily fluids of infected animals. So this could be 
the bat itself, so the saliva of them on the mango, the feces, the urine, whether it's been passed on to chimpanzees, for example. So if you're touching chimpanzees, you come into contact with chimpanzees or infected chimpanzees, you'll get the infection. And also human to human by direct contact with infected people or with items contaminated with fluids. So whether an individual has been urinating, has been bleeding, dribbling, sweating or whatever, any one of those items that has been in contact with bodily fluids then becomes a source of infection. And also sexual transmission is a big one because even after the initial infection, for quite a sustained period of time, you'll still be able to pass on your blood. So there's quite recently there was a journal published where 264 days after being cleared of Ebola, someone was still showing traces of viral RNA. So Ebola is a RNA virus. So they were still showing traces of RNA in their semen. Okay. And for that reason alone, the World Health Organization recommends safe sex practice for 12 months, even after you've you've been completely cleared from Ebola. Okay? And often they'll do this on two tests. And even on when both those two tests come back negative for RNA, for Ebola RNA, you must still practice safe sex for 12 months. Otherwise, you risk passing on Ebola to your partner. So how is Ebola diagnosed? So it can be diagnosed in a multitude of ways. You can perform enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays or ELISA, antigen capture detection tests, so testing for specific Ebola antigens, serum neutralization tests, reverse transcriptase PCR. So as I said, Ebola is an RNA virus, so in order to perform PCR, we need to get DNA, and we use the enzyme reverse transcriptase, transcriptase to transcribe RNA to DNA. We can then amplify it for analysis. And obviously, because Ebola is a virus, it is impossible to see by light microscopy because they are so, so tiny. So instead, we have to use electron microscopy as it's got the best resolution in order for us to visualize it. And also, we can isolate using cell culture medium so we can grow the Ebola virus and then we can analyze it by cell culture. So how is Ebola treated? Well, there isn't currently any approved treatment options, but there is research going on. Okay, but until some miraculous cure comes out, it's recommended to maintain fluid and electrolytes because obviously you've got the main symptom is the black diarrhea. And diarrhea alone is quite severe, so you need to make sure you maintain fluids and electrolytes such as salt, chloride, etc. You can use conventional antivirals, for example, to inhibit the growth and spread of the virus. And currently research going on for dunning et al. is a small interfering RNA called TKM 13803. And this is a lipid nanoparticle product. And again, if you want to read more about this, just go onto their paper and you can read all about it. So at the moment, it's, it's an experimental progressing into clinical trial. So it is a potential emerging treatment option. So how do we actually prevent Ebola from outbreaking in the first place? So avoid contact with fluids and contaminated items and disposing of any infectious items. So if you, when you're cleaning the infected individual, dispose of the cloth you're using to clean them, their bed sheets, their clothes, or anything which can potentially act as a source of infection. The use of personal protection equipment, so actually, as you can see on the right, wearing com complete coverage to avoid direct skin-to-skin -skin contact. And also educating individuals on, on the disease. So for example, over in West Africa, where they were treating people, as I said, because they didn't have the concept of the direct contact, you had many doctors went over there and educated them on how to properly, how to properly handle them, use of gloves, getting correct medical attention, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now I come to the end, so now it's your test cell section. So here I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I'm not going to tell you how many marks are worth, and I'm not going to tell you the marking for that. I'm going to leave that up to you to decide. So, first of all, what preventative measures can be done in order to prevent an outbreak of Ebola? And what are the common signs and symptoms of Ebola? Okay, so that's pretty much it, guys. So thank you for watching. And again, this was my second part in my emerging diseases presentation so if you haven't watched our previous one I highly recommend that so it gives you an understanding of what an emerging disease is and as always thank you for watching guys if you've got any questions leave it in the comment section below and also if you've got any questions on this specifically remember that link at the beginning I showed you to the WHO website go into that and that'll probably clarify anything else you need to know and also if you want to know anything else just do a bit of research like go into PubMed CDC website the WHO website and just have a rummage around and see what you can find out about it because as of because of the outbreak, there's plenty and plenty of research going on, all pa research papers and, and everything, okay? So as I said, thank you for watching, guys. I hope you found this useful. Peace out, guys and girls.